All righty, y'all. Let's start with some straight up confrontational truth about most people when they start whining and complaining about church. So most people who whine and complain about the church not being as supportive or caring or effective as it should be are some combination of not close enough long enough to know better or are not willing to deeply and personally invest long term in making it as supportive or caring or effective as it could be. Most who whine and complain about the church not being as supportive or caring or as effective as it could be or should be are some combination of not close enough, long enough to know better or not willing to deeply and personally invest long term in making it as supportive or caring or effective as it could be. Friends, (laughs) aside from winning the lottery, every single meaningful life-changing and community and family building thing you've ever done required deep personal investment over the long haul. Just think about God's first commands to humanity in Genesis and what they require of us to be fruitful and to multiply and to have dominion and to work the ground and keep it in order for us to do what God created us to do, which is to produce things and people that communicate his goodness and glory and that build up the community. That requires the faithfulness and the dedication to show up long-term over time in ways that are deeply personally invested. So I want to ask you, Are you deeply personally invested in the things God is doing through his people? And I don't just mean, do you watch from the sidelines or are you aware of things from afar? That never changed anybody. I'm asking you this question today. Are you deeply and personally invested in what God is doing through his people in the church, in the body of Christ, in ways that mean that Galatians 6, 1 to 6, makes sense to you. Because if you're not, it won't. You see, people who are deeply, personally invested in the church are, as Paul says here in Galatians, spiritual, such that they are regularly involved in situations where they are restoring in a spirit of gentleness those who are caught in sin. They keep watch on themselves, lest they themselves become tempted and fall prey to the same things. They are the ones who fulfill the law of Christ by bearing one another's burdens, not because they think there's something special, but because they know what it's like to have to depend on the love of Christ to save them. They test their own work. They bear their own load and they share all good things, showing themselves to be financially invested even in the body of Christ, not just as an act of worship that shows where their heart's loyalties lie, but as a way to help produce a supportive, caring, and effective environment where God strengthens his people to keep their community strong. You see, friends, there is no better way to build up our community and to keep it strong than the deeply personally invested people of God who show up faithfully in the long term and over the long haul to do his work. You want to be used of God to make your community strong. You want to be used of God for your family to be strong, for your children to grow, to become who God made them to be. Then become deeply personally invested such that these admonitions that we're studying together in Galatians 6 make sense to you. Now, in the book of Galatians, as a friendly reminder, Paul is Paul's worried about many in the church going AWOL and becoming less deeply and less personally invested because of the false teachers we call the Judaizers. They were creating problems that kept people from deep personal investment in spiritual life and growth because they were trying to sort of Jewishize the Christian faith by requiring the Gentiles, the non-Jews, to become Jewish before becoming Christian. Specifically, the Judaizers were teaching that the Jewish civil and ceremonial laws still had to be strictly followed, especially the laws about circumcision, because that was the main sign of being part of the covenant people of God, which I know is weird. And while I understand that circumcision sounds like a small and obscure thing, it doesn't take much to throw off one's faith and growth, does it? 
So these, these Judaizers, these false teachers, they were sort of theologically uh, angling for skin. Ha <laughs> ha. And Paul is not happy about it because it was keeping people from becoming deeply personally invested in the growth that God had for them. So he starts off Galatians kind of angry without what for Paul would have been a normal prayer of thanks for their faith. And Paul goes straight at the beginning into theological beast mode. Look at the first chapter of Galatians, verses 6 and 7, where he starts in on the Galatian Christians for letting themselves get sidetracked. He says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting because it had only been about a year since he himself had taught them the gospel of free grace. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. Notice right away here that he says that they are deserting God. You are deserting him who called you. And then also notice that he locates their salvation in the grace that comes from Christ. I'm astonished that you're deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. Keep reading. And you are turning to a different gospel. Verse 7. Not that there is another one, but there are some, the Judaizers, who trouble you and who want to distort the gospel of Christ. So Paul is not happy that they've let themselves get sidetracked. Jump down to verse 9. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, contrary to the gospel of free grace that I taught you, Paul is saying, well then let him be accursed. Let him be cut off and thrown aside to be damned before God because preaching circumcision and preaching this idea that you have to become a Jew before becoming a Christian is straight up heresy. In fact, later on in chapter 5, Paul, Paul is so annoyed with their teaching about circumcision that he says this in verse 12. He says, I wish that those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. If they're so serious about Judaizing the gospel of free grace and teaching circumcision as if it were salvific, as if it had saving power before God, then they should go the whole way and cut it off. So then maybe they would stop reproducing their heretical ideas. While that's a little bit of a Wakefield paraphrase, it's in keeping with what Paul is saying here. He's serious about all this. And he wants to say, instead, instead, y'all, that's the Southern Paul, Instead, the truth of the gospel isn't circumcision or following the law perfectly. The truth of the gospel is that only faith in Christ's perfect life lived for you can actually work to save you. It is faith in Christ's work and not in your own work. Christ's work is the only thing that works when it comes to being right with God. And so that's why he says this. Jump down to chapter 2, verse 16 where he says, we know, we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. In order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Can't nobody be right with God through their own works. Southern Paul again. So as we've been studying the last couple of weeks in chapters five and six, Paul says to apply that truth of the gospel. To apply that truth of the gospel, that, that it came to you as a free gift of grace that Christ earned and offered and that you received by faith. Apply that truth to your life and growth by living in freedom that shows the work of Christ and that equips you for deeper personal investment in his work through his people. I want to say all that again because it's so important for, for where we're headed today. And yes, I promise we will get to today's passage in just a bit. Paul is imploring us here in the latter parts of Galatians to apply the gospel of free grace that Christ earned and offered and that we received to apply that grace to our lives by living from and living in and for more freedom for us and for others. And you learn that. You grow into that. That happens for you as you say yes to deeper personal investment in God's work through his people. 
the body of Christ, friends, is God's designed context for your growth. That's why he tells us in Galatians 5, 13 and 14, he says, for you were called to freedom, meaning not only that you were freed by Christ from the power of sin and death, but that you were freed for this new life of living freely and openly and without fear to deeply and personally communicate and share that freedom. For you were called to freedom, he says. And then he says one word, keep reading, brothers. For you were called to freedom, brothers, to remind us that we live out that freedom in the context of family as brothers and sisters. But then he says, only do not use that freedom. Don't use your freedom. Make sure you don't use it as an opportunity for the flesh to feed selfish desires that oppose God's work through his spirit. But key phrase, through love, through the love of Christ, serve one another. This is what you were freed for, Paul says. When Christ's love freed you from the power of sin and called you to God's family where his spirit leads, it was in order to serve one another, to through the love of Christ that he modeled for us as an example that saved us to share that with others. And so that when you do this, when you through love serve one another, you are proving the Judaizers wrong. As brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, because you are living the law through Christ in ways that prove that they misapply it through works. Look at verse 14. It sums it up pretty well for us here. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul's saying if you love selflessly like Christ and because of Christ, you are living what he will call in our passage today the law of Christ. So, to finally turn to our passage for today. This idea of properly using our freedom in Christ as a chance to build up the body is something not only that you only truly see and experience if you are deeply personally invested, it's something that helps you grow. This is the kind of passage that makes sense only if you're deeply personally invested. And that deep personal investment, as we'll continue to see here, is not just about the growth of others. It's about your own. Start at Galatians 6, verse 1. Just the first word. Brothers. So in the previous verses, he had just warned them not to bite and devour one another, as he says, and he says, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. He lists numerous destructive vices that kept them disunified and that created rivalries and factions and dissension from within. He implored them, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And all of these divisive and factious things are what Paul calls the works of the flesh because they come from abusing freedom in Christ as an opportunity for selfish desire. So he starts here with family language, the word brothers, to remind them that they're on the same team and they're in the same family. And calling them brothers here is a reminder that as opposed to the works of the flesh, the, work of, the works of the spirit of God in them don't produce rivalries and selfish competition, but the work of the Spirit produces unity and mission. Show me a church on mission, unified toward godly goals, and I'll show you a church that is through love serving one another, and that is living and walking and being led by the Spirit. They support one another. They help each other in this battle of flesh and spirit because, surprise, surprise, they're deeply, personally invested in this work as brothers and sisters. So, for the rest of Galatians 1 to 6, there are, there are six practices of deeply, personally invested brothers and sisters. First being this, keep reading, Galatians 6, 1. If anyone is caught in any transgression, meaning caught in any type of sin that someone else sees or detects, and, and maybe also the nuance of especially when someone is overtaken in sin by surprise, 
in a way that they normally aren't. If anyone is caught in any transgression, he says, you who are spiritual, which is an interesting phrase we'll come right back to, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Now, this, this word spirit here that we just read in restore him in a spirit of gentleness probably does not refer to the Holy Spirit per se, but simply to the restoration being done in a gentle way in normal, regular old human terms. Is gentleness a fruit of the Spirit? Yes, of course. But the idea here is simply to say, restore the sinner with gentleness in a gentle manner so that the entire context of things that are said and done in that restoration process is gentle. Two more things to notice here. First, the word restore. The word restore that Paul uses here means to return to its former condition. It was used to describe uh, setting a broken bone, uh, resetting a dislocated joint, rebuilding broken walls, mending torn fishing nets. So in the same way, a sinner must be put back in order and restored to fellowship with one another, with the body of Christ. Second thing to note here is that the phrase, you who are spiritual, is literally the spirit people or the spirit ones. And it isn't intended to say some sort of spiritually elite class of more discerning or well-attuned or more mature Christians should be the one do, doing the restoring as if only they are qualified. As Paul has been saying in the surrounding context, you who are spiritual simply means those who have God's spirit in them by grace and are being led by and are walking by the spirit and not the flesh which means that regular, old, boring, deeply, personally invested Christians are already equipped to restore those caught in sin. Spirit people, you who are spiritual, are regular old Christians who already have everything they need because they understand grace. They understand the work of Christ for them. They have everything they need to restore brothers and sisters in a spirit of gentleness because in having experienced their own freedom in Christ, they are equipped to help others experience theirs. So the first practice of six, the first practice of deeply personally invested brothers and sisters is to restore others gently. Restore others gently. Our second practice of deeply personally invested brothers and sisters, and we're going to going to move faster here, keep reading in verse one, is to keep watch on yourself. Literally, keep an eye on yourself, lest you too be tempted. First Corinthians 10, 12 says, let anyone who thinks that he stands, lest anyone who thinks that he stands on his own, take heed lest he fall. So, restore others caught in sin, yes, but at the same time, keep an eye on yourself lest your own pride get you in trouble and you be tempted by the kinds of things that you see in others. So practice number two is keep watch on yourself. Keep watch on yourself. The third practice of deeply personally invested brothers and sisters, verse two, is to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now what Paul intends to describe here is a, a heavy and oppressive weight that could be practical and tangible like a financial burden, but it could also be any other type of burden. Whatever type of burden it may be, it's clear it's too heavy to be carried alone. We all have burdens like that, don't we? Now, many think that Paul intends a parallel here to Jesus carrying the burden of his own cross. And given that Paul is obviously saying here that bearing someone else's burden burden is a form of through love serve one another and that so doing fulfills the law of Christ. It's like saying that bearing another's burden is doing what Christ did in bearing our burden. So practice number three is bear one another's burdens like Christ did ours. Bear one another's burdens like Christ did ours. Now verse three isn't one of our six practices but it is a telling explanation of the attitude that refuses to be deeply personally invested in the body of Christ because it's too hard or because it, 
doesn't serve one's own purposes. This is the attitude at the center of superficial and impersonal investment from afar that views restoring others gently or keeping watch on yourself or bearing one another's burdens as pointless because they don't serve one's own purposes of making self the center of the universe. Paul says, verse 3, For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, notice the strong contrast here between what the person thinks he is versus what Paul says he is. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That kind of attitude is self-deception because it believes that Christ isn't needed, that the cross isn't needed. This kind of selfishness is what Paul says is at the root of believing that, that one is above the normal biblical pattern of deep personal investment that claims and applies freedom in Christ for self and for others. By the way, I've got some well-known but little applied secret sauce of how the body of Christ actually works for you here. Claiming and applying freedom in Christ for the sake of others and being deeply personally invested in their growth is not mutually exclusive with one's own growth because it is one's own growth. Briefly, the last three practices of deeply personally invested brothers and sisters. Verse four, but let each one test his own work which doesn't refer to testing whether one's own work has saving power, as we typically think about works in theological terms when we say that salvation is not by works, but merely to refer to one's own body of works done as you're being led by or walking in the Spirit, as one doing good things that come from the heart of God because you're saved and not in order to save. It's basically just a statement of saying, test your own behavior and spiritual output as a believer for yourself. And then your reason to boast will not be in someone else, but will be in yourself alone. The reason to boast will be in himself alone, as Paul says, and not in his neighbor. Now, Paul obviously isn't encouraging boastful pride, but he's saying to have a sober assessment of self so that you will have confidence in being the real deal and you won't have to compare yourself with others. Notice he says that after testing oneself, the reason to boast will be in himself alone. He's saying this confidence is within himself, within oneself, and kept there. We tracking? So, so no need to compare. No need to blab on and on about how awesome you are and what you've done, okay? Loudmouth self-talker, just boast in the work of God in you and keep it in that place only. So practice number four is test and have confidence in your own work. Test and have confidence in your own work. Now practice five is simple. Bear your own load. Look at verse five. For each will have to bear his own load. This flows naturally from the previous verse about testing one's own work. We've all got plenty of our own stuff to take care of. It's not like we don't have plenty of our own practical and spiritual burdens to bear and hard things to carry. This probably also has the nuance of expressing that on top of all the other ways that we have to help others and bear their burdens. So practice number five is simple. Bear your own load. And then the final practice of deeply personally invested brothers and sisters is number six, verse six, let the one who is taught the word, to make it simplest, that's basically you, the listener, let the one who is receiving the message share all good things. There used to be some scholars who thought that this means sharing spiritually good things, but the overwhelming majority of scholars nowadays agree that this probably means sharing financially and materially. So when Paul says, let the one who was taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches, yes, this verse does very obviously and clearly speak of financially investing in the work of the body. And though we don't have time to unpack this further other than to say this, 
If you are deeply personally invested in your growth and the growth of your brothers and sisters in Christ, financial contributions are part and parcel of your regular worship of the God who owns it all and who is the source of all your resources. So the final of our six practices of those who are deeply personally invested and our brothers and sisters a part of the body of Christ is is simply to share all good things. Share financially. Now friends, I'm going to close with a quick thought and then a question. If you know the truth of the gospel of free grace, that it came to you as a free gift that was earned and offered by the work of Christ, apply that truth to your life and growth by living from and in and for more freedom and grace that display God's work and that equip you for deeper personal investment in his work through his people. The grace that saves is the grace for us by which we live with one another that displays the gospel and it's how we grow. So since today is about assessing the depth of your own investment in the growth plan that God lays out for us here in his word, I want to ask you this question. Ask yourself this question. To what extent are you engaged in these practices in Galatians 6, 1 to 6? And what does that say about the depth of your investment in God's spiritual growth plan for you? So friends, are you, are you meaningfully engaged in the body of Christ such that Paul's admonitions here in Galatians 6 make sense to you? Or do they feel like far off impracticalities? Straight up, friends, I've seen it work like Paul says here for 25 years of ministry. Those who are deeply personally invested in the church are those who are most engaged in growing and helping others grow. Those who are most deeply personally invested in the church are those who are helping people find and follow Jesus. You see, superficial, half-hearted, and from from afar involvement in the body will mean that these kinds of verses may not make much sense to you. And you may not be particularly interested in living them out. But friends, if if you sense the Lord calling you to deeper personal investment in his vision for you, please know that we're on the lookout for those ready and willing to grow. Contact us and let us know how we can help you become who God created you to be. Father in heaven, we're gathered around your word because we trust that it has truth for us about what the gospel has done through Jesus for us in ways that weren't just a one-time thing, but that his work for us still works for us because the grace that you've given us through him is the grace by which we continue to live in freedom from day to day. And so we want to unpack that freedom and live from it and for more of that freedom in Christ so that we ourselves would grow, so that others around us would grow, so that your project of growth for us would be something we are deeply personally invested in. Because as your word tells us, Lord, your people who live from the freedom that they have in Jesus, when they come together around the mission of communicating the goodness and glory that are yours gifted to us through his work, that when we gather around that mission, your goodness and glory is on full display.
through your people whose lives demonstrate who you are and what you've done for us. Lord, we want to be deeply, personally invested over the long term for what you're doing through your people so that we would experience your presence, so that we would display your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.